Hello and welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow. With me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. We are broadcasting on all our digital platforms throughout the United Kingdom and across the world. We're bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 until 8 p.m. on Facebook, on YouTube, on X, formerly known as Twitter, and also on TikTok. Folks, please do send in your messages. Please send in your greetings. Please tell us where you are viewing from. And if you've got any questions, please also send them in tonight. We're going to be looking very much at the topic of the hour, which is Humza's Hate Speech Crime Act, which is coming into play on the 1st of April. And tonight, especially, we're going to be looking at the difference between a hate speech crime and a so-called hate speech incident. What is the significant difference And we're going to show how you can still get onto the police's bad books without having committed a crime. And we're going to be asking whether or not that is a just and democratic thing that should be happening in Scotland. So a lot to talk about. We've also got a fantastic guest coming up at 7.30 all the way from the US of A. It's the one and only authoress and historical songstress, I should also add, Avelina Balestri, who's going to be speaking about her new novel that's set in the period of the American Revolution and revolves around a group of loyalist Scots because a lot of the loyalists who were fighting for King George were, of course, from Scotland. And we're going to be telling their story. And Avelina has been at the forefront of remembering these men and women and bringing them back to our consciousness. And we're so grateful that she does that. Absolutely. So we're going to be talking with Avelina on that particular matter at 7.30. Now, folks, please do stay tuned Please do send in your messages if you're watching on TikTok. This is a Force for Goods weekly show where we are British, we love the United Kingdom, and we want to stay together. And if that's you, please do keep watching. And if that's not you, please do keep watching anyway because you will learn a lot of stuff on our fantastic show. You won't see the interview on TikTok. You'll have to go to our YouTube channel to see that. But otherwise, please do keep watching good stuff good stuff now let's see what you guys have got to say Derek first in tonight says good evening everybody there seems not to be a day on social media without the SNP and the loony hate crime bill are there lies finally coming up soon hopefully they will be out of power gypsy geek freak 17 says hello fellow patriots as does Scotland Scorpion, says good evening, everyone. And British Legend says good evening, as does Derek from Armadale. And Cat also says hello, one and all. And good to say, good to see We Say It podcast. Good evening. Um, we were on a roll on Monday because on Monday night, the We Say It podcast invited us on for an hour and a half and that's you'll find we say it on twitter at twitter.com forward slash we say it podcast and you'll also find them on rumble.com search for we say it podcast and very grateful to the team over there at we say it podcast for inviting us on to speak about humza's hate speech law it was a good evening and I really enjoyed it so thanks thanks for that guys hello to Nick Mick from 
Northumberland. And Scotland Scorpions looking forward to the guest who's going to be talking about the Loyalist Scots who fought for King George during the American War of Separation, as we like to call it, which wasn't one of the better ideas, I have to say, as far as the Americans are concerned, because um, they, they, they left the British crown to do their own thing, sadly. And time will tell whether that worked out for them or not. Christopher says, Good evening from the Scottish and British town of Falkirk. As does Tony. From, originally from Liverpool, but now in Glasgow. And George is watching all the way from the USA, so he may well be very interested. Please do comment on what Avelina is talking about this evening, George. I'm sure that will interest you. Judging by your outfit, it definitely will interest you. Is that outfit a particular regiment? Please do tell us if it is. We say it says it was a pleasure to have us on. Ah, yes, George says, looking forward to listening to my friend Avelina. Now, what we're going to talk about now is Humza's Hate Crime, Hate Speech Crime Act. And we're going to look at the difference between what are called hate crimes and hate incidents. Now, let me just very briefly explain what that is. For your words, under this new law which is coming out on the 1st of April, for your words to be a crime, they have to meet certain criteria. Depending upon who they are directed to, your words have to be either threatening and or abusive and or insulting. That is, if they are directed towards people as a consequence of their race or colour or nationality or ethnic origins, or simply threatening and or abusive if they are directed towards people on the basis of their age, disability, transgender, or other sexual characteristic or sexual orientation. So with that latter group... Um, you have to be threatening or and or abusive. However, there's a greater protection, as it were, for the, the race, colour, nationality cohort because you're not allowed to be insulting to them. But anyway, if your words are considered by a reasonable person to meet that criteria, then for a crime to be committed, they, you, it has to be proven that you had an intention to stir up hatred or that it was likely that you would stir up hatred towards people on the basis of race, colour, nationality or ethnic origin. If it's to the latter cohort of age, disability, sexual orientation and transgender, then it has to be proven that you intended the likely option there is not included. So the greatest protection is for people on the basis of race or colour or nationality or ethnic origin. But they need these these two things. The words have to be of that order and there has to be an intention there to stir up hatred or, in the case of race, stir up intention or likely to stir up hatred. And so these two things have to meet for the for it to be considered a crime. So the position then with an incident is an incident an incident is something that doesn't meet that crime criteria. An incident is simply where the words are threatening or abusive or insulting, but there's no intention there to stir up hatred or no likelihood of stirring up hatred. And so if you called somebody a name that they objected to, if a policeman came round and quizzed you on it, they would note that your words had, be con had been considered to be threatening or abusive or insulting, but that you clearly had no intention of doing it. 
t- of stirring up hatred and you had no intention uh, and there was no likelihood that you were going to stir up hatred. So they would say, well, that was just an incident. It wasn't a crime. It didn't meet the full requirement for the crime. And it therefore it wouldn't go to the procurator fiscal. It would simply be recorded as an incident. But it would be recorded. And it would be on the police Scotland's bad books. And so an awful lot of people could get caught out by that because while their actions or their words did not constitute a crime, it's still going to get reported as an incident. It's still going to get reported that somebody found your words threatening or abusive or insulting. And that will be a record that people can find if they want. And there was an article in today's Daily Mail which expanded upon that. And we'll just bring that up. Here it is here. Orwellian non-crimes threaten people's job prospects. A secret police catalogue of hate incidents could destroy job prospects as the information can be disclosed to potential employers. It was warned yesterday. People trying to get jobs working with children or vulnerable adults could find a non-crime hate incident or an NCHI being disclosed to a prospective employer without knowing it even exists. Disclosure Scotland is responsible for sharing information about people's criminal records so employers can decide if the applicant is suitable for the job. There are now fears that enhanced checks by employers to the government agency may uncover a police record of a non-crime hate incident. Now many of these non-crime hate incidences will be incredibly unfair because somebody could just have reported you because they didn't like the cut of your jib, they didn't like what you said to them in a pub, they found, they felt that they lost the argument or something like that and so they're just going to cause trouble. They're just going to be vexatious as it were or it could just be frivolous as well. So there's going to be a lot of frivolous complaints and a lot of vexatious complaints that don't meet the standard of a crime. That is to say that it cannot be shown or even imagined that you intended to stir up hatred or that it was likely to stir up hatred, but you can still get caught and recorded. Without it going to court, it can still be caught and written down as an incident. And that doesn't look very good against your name and this happened to a prominent Scottish member of the of Holyrood called Murdo Fraser and it occurred a few months ago to him and he has been recorded by Police Scotland his name has been recorded under a hate incident and he had tweeted out a wasn't really even a criticism but it was something about um, non-binary people as some people like to call themselves and it got recorded by the police as a non-crime hate incident and he didn't even know about it until he discovered it and he did a, a video that went out on Monday and it's just a short video of a couple of minutes and we'll just play it just now to explain let him explain to you his position on this i've written today to police scotland to challenge their policy around the recording of non-crime hate incidents back in november a social media post of mine criticizing scottish government policy on gender was reported to police scotland by a trans rights activist as a hate crime Police Scotland recorded this as a hate incident without informing me. Having now taken legal advice with the support of the Free Speech Union, I believe that action on the part of Police Scotland was unlawful in three respects. Firstly, the European Convention on Human Rights protects free speech and specifically protects expressions of political view. 
Secondly, there is a specific and additional protection under the Equality Act that has been established in case law for gender critical opinions, which this was. And thirdly, in recording this as a hate incident, Police Scotland breached the Data Protection Act. These are serious and timely matters. Scotland's new hate crime law comes into force in a few days' time on the 1st of April, on April Fool's Day, appropriately enough. And what we are likely to see is the police being deluged with hundreds, if not thousands, of spurious and vexatious complaints. And if they record all these as hate incidents based entirely on the perception of the complainer, they are likely to be recording many more hate incidents unlawfully and acting against the law. I believe that Scotland needs to be a country where free speech and freedom of political expression is protected. Absolutely, 100%. That's very well said by Murdo Fraser, who is a Conservative MSP at Holyrood and who's found himself at the wrong end of the long arm of the law for what was essentially an innocuous tweet, simply giving his opinion on the, um, the question of gender. And it's simply unacceptable that people are going to be recorded in the police books as a consequence of that. Now, he spoke there about what he believed were his three defences. And the first one, which is a powerful defence, is the Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is written into British law. It is written into the Human Rights Act 1998, Schedule 1. And I'll just read Article 10 for you. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority and regardless of frontiers. Now, that's, that's a fairly wide-ranging law and for the government to prevent you having that freedom of expression it really does need to have as it says here in part two it really does need to be necessary in a democratic society to penalize you and there is no reason why in a democratic society that sort of relatively harmless free speech should not be allowed so i do think that he has a strong case as far as that is concerned. The second thing that he referenced was the Equality Act. Now the Equality Act is actually about discrimination in employment. So I'm wondering how he would bring that into the equation and what I think it will be uh, almost certainly is him pointing out that it could discriminate people's job prospects. It could discriminate against people's job prospects. Um, therefore, it would be discriminatory as far as your employment chances are concerned. So he might have a case under the Equality Act. And the third point that he made was that it probably contravenes the Data Protection Act, whereby the police are recording your personal details without telling you. So I think he's got a pretty strong case on at least two, if not all three, of those objections. The ECHR, Freedom of Speech, Article 10 defence, the Equality Act defence that it's discriminating against potential employment and it's also contravening the Data Protection Act. And interestingly enough, this has been visited before in England and Wales last year. Far too late in the day, really, but a bit of, um, a bit of uh, controversy got up around it. And I think it was the Free Speech Union that, that highlighted this. And they were able to change police practice in England and Wales. And 
I'll just bring up the um, the guidance for the police these days. Um, new code and guidance for non-crime hate has come into force for officers and staff responding to reports of non-crime hate incidences. The code issued by the Home Secretary provides guidance to the police in England and Wales for recording non-crime hate incidents. For some reason, the Home Secretary thought good to to tell police in England and Wales, but did not extend the guidance to Scotland. Now, that will be because of the devolved situation, um, which just shows you how we also lose out when when sensible things come in in England and Wales and they leave it to Homza Yusuf and the Scottish Parliament of all people to sort it out here in Scotland. Anyway, the code introduces an additional threshold test. This clarifies that personal data should only be included in a non-crime hate incident record if the event presents a real risk of either significant harm to individuals or groups with a particular characteristic or a future criminal offence being committed against individuals or groups with a particular characteristic. In other words, you'd have to be a very serious case for them to do that, for them to continue to note your details. Here we have Chief Constable Andy Marr saying, A new code and guidance are now in place for officers when responding to non-crime hate incidences. These incidents should not be recorded where they are trivial, irrational, or if there is no basis to conclude that an incident was motivated by hostility. Furthermore, under the code, if an individual's personal data is is processed as part of an NCHI, that is a non-crime hate incidence, they should be promptly notified unless the notification presents a safeguarding risk to the complainant. They should be promptly notified. Well, people like Murdo Fraser there were not even notified at all until they found out themselves. And so this is what Suella Braverman had to say. Catching dangerous criminals and bringing them to justice should be the police's primary focus. And I have been clear that in recording non-crime hate incidents, Officers must always have freedom of expression at the forefront of their minds. I am pleased that the College of Policing has published updated operational guidance to ensure the code of practice approved by Parliament is applied consistently. Now the police will only record non-crime hate incidents when it is absolutely necessary and proportionate and not simply because someone is offended. Well, Hallelujah. Three cheers for that. That was brought in, though, as I say, in England and Wales back in June 2023. It's not been brought in in Scotland. They've left it to the Scottish Parliament. They've left it to the Scottish Parliament to deal with that. And of course, if you leave it to the Scottish Parliament to deal with it, it's never going to be dealt with and we're never going to have something as sensible as that. So what we have to hope is that somebody, a high profile person like an MSP, like Murdo Fraser, he does take it to court. And if the court finds that it has a case and there will be no doubt that the England and Wales precedent will be very persuasive to the Scottish court. If the Scottish judge finds that Murdo Fraser has a case under Freedom of Expression Article 10 and or the Equality Act and or data protection and considering the state of affairs in England and Wales, if they agree that uh, Police Scotland are in the wrong, then and only then will Police Scotland be forced to change. Then and only then will the Justice so-called Department here in Scotland put new rules together regarding hate incidents. And quite frankly, I am optimistic because I think it's a no-brainer. I think the judge 
will definitely will definitely follow the precedent in England and Wales, no question about it, which will then put pressure upon uh, upon Hamza Yusuf and Holyrood to change the guidance for Police Scotland. Because it has to happen, because otherwise they're going to be logging all of these incidents which are not sufficient to be considered crimes. They're going to be logging all these incidents which are just people calling each other names and which are just uh, consisting of people being offended by various points of view. They're going to be logging all this frivolous stuff, all of this vexatious stuff, all of this trivial stuff, and it's going to be an absolute colossal waste of police time. And the police will definitely want a much a much uh, firmer guideline on what they should and should not do in that situation. So I'm optimistic that if if, uh, if, if um, Murdo Fraser does take this forward, then I'm very optimistic that at least hate incidents can, can change. The definition of a hate incident can change and an awful lot of frivolous stuff will go by the by. But we'll still have the actual Hate Crime Scotland Act in place. And the question is going forward, what's going to happen with that? To what extent is that going to remain on the books? And there's a couple of options one is that a high-profile person does get accused of a crime such as a J.K. Rowling or um, a Kelly Jean Minshall or somebody like that. A high-profile person gets accused of a crime and they take it and it gets taken to court and they win and the parliament has to take a second look at the bill. And... Um, it may be that several cases will start going to court and people will be winning them. They won't be getting convicted. And it might be that we have something that's resem that resembles the, the law that they brought in for the football, which was the uh, Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Scotland Act 2012, which they actually had to repeal. The Scottish Parliament had to repeal it because it was unworkable. So that's a possibility. We could be looking at the law being repealed. The other possibility, perhaps more likely, is that they'll keep it on the books, but they will amend it, and they'll amend it with far stronger freedom of speech defences. Because while there are defences in the document, in the Act, which we looked at last week, they are not watertight especially they're not watertight around the sexual orientation, transgender rights points of view. And indeed, I was reading this article by Joanne Cherry. Women have every right to be concerned about Hate Crime Act. And this appeared in The National on the 22nd of March. And she said that they had put forward suggestions for watertight defences on this particular issue upon the women's rights issues and they had not been accepted one of the defences that she had wanted was a defence that read quote behaviour or material is not to be taken to be threatening or abusive solely on the basis that it involves or includes discussion or criticism of matters relating to transgender identity Close quote. The amendment was drafted, but when I tweeted my support for it, I was accused of transphobia. Nicola Sturgeon tweeted her now infamous broom cupboard broadcast. I was sacked from my position on the SNP front bench, and the amendment was ditched in what I can only describe as an atmosphere of hysteria. Well, it's very possible. And we do have to hope that either the bill is repealed or after one or two prominent court cases, which are won by the free speech advocates, very possibly they might change the bill to amend elements of it to make freedom of speech much stronger in the bill, to make much stronger 
freedom of speech defences. However, it is the, the, the Scottish executive, it is the SNP that we're talking about, so we can't be guaranteed of that. But I think one thing we can be guaranteed of is it's going to become a massive headache for Hamza Yusuf, a massive headache. And somebody who recognises that is is the <laughs> is Alex Salmond. And he also recognises who's at the bottom of this in this article here from the, the National on the 1st of March. And I read the National so that you don't have to. He said, The Greens or what we like to call the Scottish Cabbage Party, spell real trouble for the SNP. Their contribution to government is entirely negative. Every governmental disaster from administering the bottle scheme to self-identification has green fingers all over it. For the Greens, independence is a flag of convenience, something which secures their ministerial meal tickets. Well, to use his metaphor, the so-called hate Speech Crime Act has also got green fingers all over it, and it may well be that the match made between the SNP and the Greens will be their downfall, and for that we can only hope. Now folks, if you're angry about the hate speech so-called act, there is going to be a demonstration against it on the 1st of April, that is on Monday, the bank holiday Monday. 1st of April outside Holyrood it's it's um, there we go hate speech law protest outside Holyrood at 1 30 p.m. on the 1st of April that's Monday coming and it's hosted by several people there'll be the Glasgow cabbie will be speaking there'll be representatives from the Scottish Family Party and we hear there's going to be other speakers there as well, one or two of which have been on our show in the past as well. So if you can, if you're off work, if you're in Edinburgh, or if you're not in Edinburgh, you want to go over there and and just show your opposition, if nothing else, to it, please go along to Hollywood at 1.30pm on the 1st of April to protest against this hate speech law. Okay? Now, folks... We are delighted to welcome our guest on tonight, Change of Tack. We're going to be speaking about the Loyalist Scots in the North American Revolution back in 1775 to 1777. And we have the one and only Avelina Balestri who is going to be speaking upon that. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Avelina. Hello, Good Alistair. Good Hello, thank you. you. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you also to Megan and Duncan as well for all of the work they're doing for the show and, and making it possible. Oh, I also want to give a shout out to um, Ian Inkster, who very kindly drove us around the UK um, and was our uh, a comrade in arms, if you will, um, during my trip to the UK in October. I really badly wanted to get up to Scotland. Unfortunately, wasn't able to um, due to having to run a conference in Cambridge and scheduling just got kind of crazy. But I did, I did, I did get a very good taste of Scotland with Ian. <laughs> so I was very glad to have to be able to have him on board with me. Great. Well, do you know what? We're so glad that that you came over to Scotland, and we're absolutely fascinated by your particular interest in Scotland because it's not like you have Scottish heritage I, i'm presuming it's not anyway do you have any british i'm not 100 I, I do have english i'm not 100 i do have irish i'm not 100 percent sure about scottish or welsh but i do have some british isles so <laughs> so there, there's that it, i would have to actually do a test of some type though some family sort of genealogical forays that my cousins have gone on claim that we're uh, related in some way to woodrow wilson who was scots irish so there is a possibility that I have a little bit of Scottish, but it's not, it's predominantly Italian <laughs> with a, a blend of a lot of other things in there. A, a full, full on American mutt. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I love American Italians. Absolutely. Um, fantastic. We, we bring you, we bring you, we bring, we bring you pizza and opera. Mm. So <laughs> yeah. 
and, and generally very sensible as well as Americans go. I find the the American Italians. I used to know. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I used to know one myself many years ago. But let's talk about your book. Firstly, you've got a a, a novel, a historical novel that's coming out, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that later in the show. But it's based around the idea of the the loyalists, the British loyalists, fighting the American. Um, separatists, as I like to call them. Um, what got you interested in that field of study, firstly? Well, the American Revolution was something that has interested me all the way back to basically my childhood. Um, it just, it fascinated me the general time period of the long 18th century, which a lot of historians kind of consider to be the period between like the Glorious Revolution in 1688 to the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. So that whole era um, really drew me in. Um, and I was interested by things like the French and Indian War and the American Revolution because I've been a, a lifelong Britophile. And so it was interesting to me to see the British roots of America and the nature of you know, that origin, but also the split. Um, it was, it just fascinated me kind of what, you know, went on with that and the complexity of it, because oftentimes it, it is treated with a serious lack of complexity. Um, you know, there's just this tendency to, to even view it, for example, as very much of like Americans on one side, British on the other. And there's a lack of understanding that Americans were up to that point British and, um, and British people had all kinds of manifold connections with America. Um, you know, they, it was one people, it was one empire. Um, and sure, there was, there was tensions, there was prejudices, there was all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, this was a civil war um, with people of common kinship and under a common king um, who, you know, set to fighting one another. And it, it is quite tragic in that sense. It's like a family breakdown in some way. And I always felt that when dealing with the American Revolution, that there is a real sense of, of tragedy that, that comes with it, and um, which I think oftentimes gets forgotten. So it's, it's one of the elements that I do bring out in the, the novel, um, which is um, going to be released on May 28th. It's currently available for pre-order digitally. Um, on Amazon. It's called, uh, the, the entire trilogy that is planned is called All Ye That Pass By. And the first book is entitled Gone for a Soldier. And it follows a, a young man from a Catholic recusant family in Lancashire in the north of England, who ends up on the staff of General John Burgoyne, the British general who is the commander of the Saratoga campaign in 1777. And the campaign essentially was a plan by the British um, government. It was mostly put together by Burgoyne himself to split the colonies. Um, and there, thereby, he was hoping to draw loyalist Americans to his side. These are Americans loyal to the crown um, and get allied native tribes to come in on his side and you know with the aid of hessian um mercenaries and allies and so forth that he would be able to um work with the other british generals william howe and barry st leaguer and they would be able to divide the colonies and therefore um cut the rest of them off from new england and crush the rebellion the problem is things went very, very wrong for Burgoyne and Murphy Law came in all over the place and it became an unmitigated disaster in, in so many different ways um, that that actually fascinated me as well. Saratoga campaign was the turning point of the American Revolution and it also has an absolutely Shakespearean quality um, when, when viewed from the um, British and British American side of the fence. It, it is a Shakespearean tragedy of um, good intentions gone awry uh, by uh, circumstances and human failings. And, um, and and so that just always, the, the, the sort of pathos of that drew me in as well as the very colorful characters who were involved in it. 
So it, it was always something of interest. And I only finally got around to starting to write it when I got a bit taxed <laughs> writing my um, Robin Hood series. And I put out the first book of that, Softlings of Sherwood, which I mentioned on the last time I was here. So I got a bit taxed from doing that project. So I wanted to do something a little different. I said, oh, why not pull back my old 18th century interest and, and get going with that? So so that has been what I've been working on. And, and that, again, will be coming out um, May 28th. But it is available for those with Kindle currently to um, pre-order purchase it. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I really I really like that as well, because there's a tendency among some Americans to simply see everything from understandably, of course, from the American victor's standpoint and not to see it from the British American standpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know uh, to what extent, and I shouldn't imagine your particular viewpoint is is widely known you know i think that uh, that to the victors the the spoils and also the history book uh, also for for the victors so bringing yes that, definitely bringing the, and there is the a tendency element out is fantastic yeah there's definitely a tendency i think again to sort of simplify it simplify yeah. it down to the point where um, it, it, like, for example, I, I have been reading a lot of, of literature, um, fiction literature about the American Revolution to kind of balance off what I'm doing with what's out there. And, and a lot of it just kind of lacks. It lacks in terms of, um, not all of it, of course, but, but, but some of it lacks, a lot of it lacks in terms of awareness that this is a civil war. And I think that the reason for this is because in the American Civil War, when you think about it, right, the the Union side won. So therefore, when we reflect back on it, or at least traditionally, there was this emphasis on reunion and binding up wounds and trying to pull everybody back together. Well, in the American Revolution, of course, the opposite happened. The, as you say, separatist side won. So therefore, the, there is not that same emphasis about the sort of pathos and emotion behind a people at war with themselves. Um, but it's just, I think for me, it just always resonated because I do feel Britain is kind of a second homeland to me. It's just always been that way. So I always have felt on some level, um, you know, <laughs> British American on some, some, you know, original level and being a Marylander part of like, one of the original 13 colonies, it just kind of, just kind of was natural to me to feel that way. Um, and being kind of a royalist as well. I just always yeah. felt this particular um, spiritual connectivity with them, um, with the idea of kingship and with the even dynastic, you know, succession and generations of that and so forth. Yes, yes. Well, absolutely. Now, I'd like you to talk about, and we'll just kind of touched on each of them fairly briefly but i know that you've been researching into three particular scottish officers mm -hmm. who led loyalists during the war and unfortunately they all met fairly unfortunate ends but um, heroically <laughs> but, but heroically as well mm -hmm. and i just want to we'll be we'll flash up your your youtube page there but um, I just want people to be conscious that you're also a musician and a singer, and mm -hmm. we won't we won't play the music because if we played the music, we'd get a copyright strike from YouTube, and they demonetize. Did you want me to sing? Did you want me to Please. sing like one verse of something? <laughs> if you wanted, I could. <laughs> if YouTube doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? That, that probably would be a bit of a. Um, that might be a problem as well if they if you sang it too closely to what because they would pick it up as music. So that's fine. That, they can, I'm sure yeah. they can go and hunt me down. I'm I'm out yeah. there. They'll. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we'll actually um, bring up just the uh, the page anyway, which is this one is called "The Day Is Your Own," and uh, what's what's this one about? It's about Major John Pitcairn. Um, one of his last words was, this day is ours. So it's a paraphrase of that. 
So um, we have a brief um, synopsis on Major Pitt Karen. Um, he's been someone I've been fascinated with since I was like 12. <laughs> he just His very colorful story just totally took me in. So he was a native of Dysart, um, what is now part of Kirkaldi and Fife. And um, when, when I was, you know, around 14, I literally called up the Historical Society there, ended up befriending um, a wonderful lady who worked there, Carol McNeil. And we did massive amounts of research on this. Um, but uh, Major Pitcairn, um, his father was a chaplain in the Cameronian Regiment, which was had a strong Covenanter history to it. And these are the people who are very, very zealous, we'll put it that way. Um, they had a, a tradition actually of signing, they would receive Bibles when signing up to the regiment. Um, and some of them would sign their Bibles in blood. They were very much attached again, the Covenanter tradition of the 17th century. And then um, they wound up being kind of incorporated, brought into peace, if you will, with the kings. I can't go into the whole history of that. There's a whole sure. interesting history. So suffice to say, they had been in kind of re rebellion against the kings for quite some time because they were, you know, hardcore Presbyterians. And, um, you know, they were kind of under the thumb of the Anglicans. And then what ends up happening is that they get kind of post glorious revolution incorporated in um, and you get the Cameronian regiment. And so um, Major Pitt Caron's dad was a chaplain in that regiment under Marlborough during the War of Spanish Succession, et cetera. So he has this very interesting background that way. Then he ends up becoming the uh, moderator at St. Serf's Church in Dysart. Um, and so uh, Major Pitt Caron, John Pitt Caron, is born and raised in the old manse building right next door to the church. And he grows up there with his um, family. And this is like on the steps of the sea. So, you know, uh, Pitt Heron is drawn to the sea and he ends up being drawn into the Marines. Um, and so he becomes a very, very vocal advocate for the Marines being named Royal because they weren't at this time. They weren't actually oh, yeah. permanently standing force. Um, they kept being raised and then the plug pulled. So, for example, in like the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion, and they'd be raised and then the plug would be pulled later on. And this keeps happening to Pitt Karen through his life. And he's constantly saying, why are you doing this? We need standing Marines and we need to make them royal um, and we need to be paid better. <laughs> so he's a very vocal advocate for all things Marines. And, um, you know, when he ends up, so he ends up again being slightly involved that the marines were raised for the jacobite situation um and again he's a for all of those who think like have it in their heads that all uh scots were jacobites or vice versa it's just not true so he's sure. a hanoverian um and so so he's you know fight you know being raised for the government as a security measure and then after the war that that gets the plug pulled on that he then is a veteran of the seven years war the french and indian war takes place uh, uh, takes part in the Louisburg campaign. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, he um, he is married with 10 kids himself, has quite a family life, and um, was marked by everybody as being um, the best of husbands and fathers, which I think is a nice thing to remember him for as well. He had a very good rapport with his family and everybody noted that about him. Um, and he was always zigzagging throughout his life um, from up in Scotland and in, in Dysart in Edinburgh, down to Kent, out to Cornwall, to London. You know, he, he moved around a lot. Um, and so then we get to the American Revolution, which is when he kind of comes onto the stage. Um, and he is sent with his Marines to Boston, uh, where he is quartered and where he is, you know, part of the force there to try to quell this, this rebellion. This is in, um, you know, this is after the Boston tea party they yeah, shut down yeah. the port and they bring in the, the british um army and marines in this case so he ends up um on north square uh right next to where paul revere lives he gets quartered um and he he knows revere though and he ends up um sort of pseudo befriending him as well as a number of other prominent patriots in the area he holds salon at the house where he's quartered and he essentially has just kind of social events um, yeah. And you know, he, people liked him. People who were completely politically opposite him liked him. They considered him a very, 
relatable guy. He was he was very much of somebody who um, was down to earth. He was no frills. Um, he could be pretty hardcore and rough around the edges, but he was someone who people just felt like they could trust and someone who would be honest with them and be fair in his dealings. Um, and so he got on with people and even the very, um, very vocal patriot propagandist um ezra styles called him a good man and a bad cause which was a lot from him um so so we fast forward in time you know pit karen has this rapport in town um and he's trying to train his marines and there's all kinds of chaos going on with that <laughs> with, with which is chronicled in his letters that's another whole thing so he ends up though what, what really gets to the famous point is lexington and concord so this is the beginning of the war this is april um 19th 1775 and uh, General Thomas Gage, he's the head of the British in Boston at the time, he basically sends out a party to confiscate armaments that were being amassed in Concord. Um, and Pitt Karen wasn't even supposed to go on the mission. He literally just kind of volunteered because one thing this man was is hyper. And he really wanted to get out of town and do something. So he basically volunteers. Gage doesn't even know he's volunteered. So what ends up happening is he ends up in like the advance party, the advance guard, that confronts the Minutemen, the militiamen at Lexington and Concord, where the shot heard round the world takes place. So in American history, what Pitt Karen, if, if anybody says like Major Pitt Karen, what people think here most of the time is, is a line of dialogue, which is disperse ye rebels, ye villains disperse. Why don't you lay down your arms? Disperse or you're all dead men. And that is what Pitt Karen uh, you know, shouts at the militiamen. Well, they don't do that. So, <laughs> so a shot is fired, and more shots are fired, and the war begins. So, so Pitt Karen uh, goes goes on to Concord, where they they do find bits and pieces of, of uh, ammo that they burn, but they can't find most of it. It's been hidden because Paul Revere and friends did a really good job alerting the whole countryside. So. Um, you know, what, what you end up with is, um, they get harassed all the way back when trying to march back to Boston. Pitt Karen gets his horse shot out from under him and gets wounded and loses his, um, scroll butt pistols, um, which eventually actually get, um, captured by Israel Putnam, the guy famous at Bunker Hill for saying, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes up on the top of the hill, which becomes ironic because Pitt Karen is leading the third charge of the British up Bunker Hill. Um, so this is when, uh, you know, another element of, of where um, Pitt Karen becomes quite a figure, um, as we note in that famous painting of the death of General Warren. Well, Pitt Karen is in the, in the painting as well, getting shot. Um, and so basically he is kind of mad that they didn't let the Marines up first because he's like, why did you withhold? And this is another whole issue with him. And like, they're not letting the Marines do what the Marines do, which is lead this, this whole operation. They let the, the first two charges go and then they brought the Marines out. But anyway, he makes up for that by just being super, <laughs> super high energy. And, um, and he famously shouts to his men now for the glory of the Marines, this day is ours. And, he gets wounded twice, but won't get off of the field. Um, whenever someone complains to him about the extreme heat of the day, this is June 17th, um, and it happens to be like extreme heat, heat wave. He says a soldier should inure himself to deal with heat or cold and not even notice the weather. And um, and he he's just full throttle on this. And, and, and so then he ends up getting shot four times in the chest. Um, and collapses backwards into the arms of his son, William, who's also a Marine, who then um, drags his father off of the hill and down to the boats by the Charles River, kisses him, puts him in the boat, and then goes back to the battle because he knows that's what his father would want him to do. So uh, Pitt Karen, um, later on, a number of hours later, shocks the doctor by still being alive. They thought, no, he's you know, probably toast, um, like instant toast, but he's not, he's, he's conscious hours later and able to communicate with the doctor who's been sent over by General Gage, a loyalist American doctor, and, um, and is able to converse with him, set his affairs in order and so forth before the doctor finally, um, pulls open his coat to try to see where, where everything is at and causes a terrible hemorrhage. And he basically bleeds to death from that. Um, and the floorboards got stained with his blood and wound up being kind of a tourist trap for ages after that. 
And afterwards, his son, William, um, is seen wandering the streets of Boston covered in blood. It's this very kind of uh, chilling sequence. And some pedestrians essentially go over to him and see if he's okay. And um, he says, it's it's not my blood, it's not my blood, and keeps repeating that. And then finally saying, I've lost my father, I have lost my father. And some Marines who were standing near, nearby then say, oh my God, we have all lost a father. So it was a very um, moving sequence and, and really um, a sign really of, of Pitt Karen's paternal quality towards both his actual kids and the Marines. He was the father of the Marines. Um, and of course, in the end, the Marines do become royal. Um, so he, he foresaw that and it did happen. And um, so he, he, was a, he was a British hero and he was a Scottish hero and, and he went down gallantly. Well, thank you so much for recounting his his tale because he's not a man I had ever heard of. And it's amazing to know that he played such an important part in the American War at that yeah, time. Yeah, I definitely wish uh, he was he was better known in, in Britain, certainly, because I feel like well, there we, is a deficit. Mm -hmm. We've got to make him better known. So we've uh, recorded his information. We'll remember him on his death every year across our platforms and Excellent. Try, to tell, try to tell his story as much as we can. You're telling his story along with, and we don't have time to hear about the other two, but here's the picture that you referenced. Um, that's him not in the white to the left there. That's the American, right? That's General Warren. That's General Warren. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the middle also there, towards, yeah, towards the right-hand the side there. falling was, into... Yeah, he's the one falling into the arms of of his son. Um, so right. the what the, the British officer right by um, Warren, who's he is um, also a Scot, by the way, Captain John Small, um, and he right. actually was friends with Warren um, from Boston. And this scene is showing him trying to knock the bayonet out of the way because he was trying to get Warren to surrender to save his life, and then his his um, like aide, a soldier near him, just shot Warren in the head, but Small was still trying to save him in the last minutes and knock the, the bayonet out of the way. So that's another whole story right there. Right, right, right. Fascinating. Well, you've written 19 verses in your song. I was just counting them there, which your song, The Day Is, The Day Is Your Own. Is Your Own. The Day Is Your Own. Yeah, I kind of leaned into I'm Go ahead. Just, I'm just going to read that. That day is your own. We each are judged alone. Your maker you must meet beyond the whims of history. May you receive your amnesty before the judgment seat. Well, there you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for doing the work that you do. And Oh, you're telling, welcome. And hopefully, telling those hopefully stories. it's going to Hopefully at some point we'll be, we'll be able to get back on about General Fraser and um, Major Ferguson, um, you know, upcoming because they, they would be very fascinating figures to cover as well. And Fraser plays a major, major role within the book I'm writing um, because he was one of the top brass at Saratoga, basically um, Burgoyne's, one of Burgoyne's like right hand men uh, during that campaign. So he, he's very, very fascinating and a, a Highlander. Um, so, so, I'd love to talk about him at some point as well, and Ferguson. Good, good. Well, we must, we must uh, always remember that part of our history as well. And it's so good that you, as an American, are what's the phrase? Open-minded enough to to see both sides of the story there. And well, it's our side too. You've got to think. I, I think the important thing to remember too is it's it's for me. It's not it's not even um, like trying to get inside of a foreign you know entity's perspective for me it's just like we all were one people we all were one people um and therefore it's very easy to 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 go there if you will and i think what's important too in this particular show and in this particular case is to remember that these people were scottish and british and the two identities went together seamlessly um, in terms of how they ultimately um, fought and died under the Union flag. Um, and they, you know, 
really gave their all for for that for king and country that does matter and um you know i think that there there's something that gets forgotten about that i would say that these figures are, are actually what made me care um about the union more because of of their sacrifice and because they in many ways made britain what she was even in defeat and i think that's even in a way there's a certain heroism to that that even in defeat um you know one can still close close their lives well uh, ferguson actually had a quote just to wrap up um major patrick ferguson had a quote which i'm going to paraphrase i don't have it but essentially he said at the end of the day if we follow in a sense what what the creator gives us um in, in terms of um applying ourselves with honor to the situation at hand then if we change from this life to the next in one year or 50 years it won't be for the worse mm -hmm. yeah yeah i like that um work with eternity in mind sort of thing um mm -hmm. definitely definitely yeah. because it, yeah. it, it is something that again when i'm writing these characters when i'm reading about these characters for me it, it's always there you know because i'm i'm a christian i'm a catholic it, it matters to me the idea of the souls that have gone before us so it's something that is very it, it's something that's very important to me when i'm doing the writing and when i'm doing the story especially dealing with people's deaths it, it brings yes. this hallowed sense to mind. Yes, yes, I could see that when I was reading the the texts of mm -hmm. your your verses of your song that that was very much part of what was motivating you here. Scotland they kind of Scorpion. became Scotland Scorpion says I'm listening to Avelina's beautiful singing on her YouTube channel. Oh, thank Absolutely. you. <laughs> and your YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash at you have to put the at in on this particular case at avelina balestri which for those who are listening on the audio podcast is spelt a v e l l i n a b a l e s t r i youtube.com forward slash at avelina balestri avelina it's been a real pleasure listening to you yes would, would same to you to as you well on. Your book is 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 um, coming out now. Let me uh, on May twenty eighth. May May twenty eighth, and you simply mm -hmm. search Amazon. And you can pre order. For, you can pre order it digitally. Digitally, unfortunately, Amazon is very finicky and it won't let me do physical copy pre order. But you can digitally do it, um, and then it will be in hard copy and in a digital released on May twenty eighth. So. There that would be such Amazon to... for all ye that pass by. Is I'd like to wish everyone a I'd like to wish everyone a blessed Holy Week as well and a happy Easter. Absolutely, happy Easter to <laughs> you as well this weekend, Avelina. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much. We'll You're very you welcome. On it. We'll have you back on again, and we we'll look forward to chatting. Folks, Excellent. Let's say goodbye to Avelina. Good thank night. you. Thank you so much. God bless. Bye. Bye now. Fantastic. Avelina, a very, very talented American historian and writer and musician. And we're very, very happy to know Avelina. George Bray says, outstanding. And Ian says, thanks there. And Catherine says, happy Easter. There we go. Avelina, thank you for an exceptionally interesting talk tonight. Avelina is a great friend of A Force for Good, and we hope to have you back soon as a guest. Happy Easter, Avelina, from the staff at AFFG, and that's written by one of the team there tonight. Thanks for that message. Good, good, good. Folks, talking about books on Amazon, we have our own book here. It's called One Big Country, a big book for the Union, Volume 1. And again, you can find that on Amazon by simply going to amazon.co.uk and searching for One Big Country. Search Amazon for One Big Country and you'll get that book. It's only 9 dollars 
It's exceptionally well written. It's exceptionally easy to understand. It's exceptionally well worth your time as well. If you've ever wondered, what do these unionists believe in? Well, you simply buy that and you could read this in two or three hours and it will give you all the gen that you need to know. It's 12 years of our work encapsulated in 180 pages really really worth your while and it gives you lots of good ideas of how to advocate for our wonderful united kingdom so please do go to amazon and search for one big country only 9.99 and that includes postage in the uk good stuff good stuff folks derek says happy easter everyone have a great weekend Christopher says, highly recommended, comprehensive, and well-structured. Let's get a screenshot of that classic phrase. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good stuff. Derek says, great show. Lots of comments tonight. Sorry I wasn't able to bring them all up. Um, Alan says, excellent guest. Catherine says, very, thank you, Avelina, very interesting as does Chris. George Bray says, very good presentation, Avelina. Well, we've had a lot of good people watching tonight on X. It's been it's been really worthwhile tonight. We're going to be back next week. We've got a, a guest who is going to... A guest who is, uh, many of you will know, um, he'll be coming back on next Wednesday now just to remind you there is the protest outside Holyrood on this coming Monday at 1.30pm on Monday the 1st of April folks please do if you can get along to that there you go hate speech law protest against it and stand up for freedom of speech stand up for your right to freedom of expression as guaranteed to you by not only the brits who have fought and died for it in the past but also by the laws that exist today such as our human rights act 1998 which gives you the right to freedom of expression and which this law clearly contradicts so stand up for freedom of speech outside Holyrood at 1.30 this coming Monday, 1st of April. Good. Okay, folks, that's it for this week. Look forward to being back with you next week. Thanks for everybody who sent in the comments. Lots of comments tonight. Over 450 people watching tonight. Very pleased about that. We'll be back next Wednesday between 7 and 8 Thanks to our guest, Avelina Balestri. Check out her work on YouTube. It just remains for me to say, God bless the United Kingdom and God save the King. See you next time.